Hello and welcome to this discussion on the hybrid organisation, how we think the organisations of the future will have to change because of lockdown and COVID and what will actually happen as we reimagine our organisations for a post-COVID world. So we don't need to talk too much about what has changed. Clearly, we've all seen huge change to the way that we work and to the technology that we use. Uh, Satin Della, CEO of Microsoft, says we saw two years of digital transformation happen within just a couple of months. We saw companies have to innovate on how they work in terms of contactless shopping, taking telehealth and doing curbside pickup and other changes to their technology to adapt to support their customers. What we saw at Microsoft was just huge changes in the adoption of technology. You know, we've seen five billion meeting minutes of teams in a single day. We've seen the use of video more than double as people have just shifted to remote working and video based working. And we've had other technologies like Windows Virtual Desktop enable companies to access their corporate data and applications when they maybe don't have mobile devices for, for their employees to use historically. And we've learned quite a lot as we think about remote working over the last few months. Um, broadly, there has been an awful lot of positives for people. Um, you know, historically, we've been talking in the IT business about remote working for quite some time, but never really seen massive pickup. And of course, the arrival of the pandemic has forced everybody to go and do it. And there's really been quite some surprising learnings about how effective it can be. So there have been a number of benefits. Clearly, we've had a lot of reduced travel, which is good for the environment, as well as saving people an awful lot of time. And many people have felt the benefits of that uh, work-life balance and being able to be with their families a lot more and reduce commuting time. People have actually found in many situations that their productivity has increased because they're able to be more focused in a less distracted environment and they can work at the hours that work for them. And companies have had some additional benefits, such as potential reductions in office costs, not just a physical space, but the costs of running and managing those offices as well. And there's been some unusual benefits like the ability to start recruiting talent on a global basis because it's no longer critical that people are geographically bound when, in order to come to your office. And actually not just personal productivity has improved in many situations, but organisational productivity as people have just cut through the old processes to just get on with rapid decision making and they've been forced to be being very agile. And that's helped organisations look at how they operate at higher speeds in new ways. But of course, it hasn't all been rosy plain sailing for everybody as well. There's been a number of challenges that have become apparent given the number of months that we've now been living under these conditions. Firstly, many people just crave that human contact, the ability to be included uh, and to get together with your peers in an organisation. It's hard to maintain a corporate culture when the organisation isn't able to get together physically and create that level of identity. And it's been particularly challenging for some people early in career in terms of the talent development, how people have been able to not necessarily been able to build the networks that they would otherwise have done or get the time mentoring and really setting down kind of informally over coffees to develop themselves. Not everybody has the right home office environment. Uh, again, if you haven't got the space to have an effective desk, if you're trying to work balanced on the end of your bed, then not as, this isn't necessarily ideal. Again, if you haven't got air conditioning or heating or what have you, it can be challenging to work in a home environment. And that can lead to challenges around employee wellness as people start to feel that level of disconnection and remoteness from always being on their own. And of course, the informal networking that many organisations rely on for information to be shared and to spread and for innovation. And those, you know, unexpected moments of creativity, the water cooler and coffee moments that just haven't been happening. We've seen some data as well in terms of the uptake of all of this and how people are looking at the world going forward. Uh, clearly, quite a large number of managers expect to have much more home working flexibility and new policies post the pandemic. Um, and many, many employees actually want to take opportunity, not necessarily entirely, but of significantly greater opportunities for remote working. Um, although, as we've highlighted, there definitely are some challenges and 62 percent of people feel say they do feel more disconnected uh, when they are working entirely remotely. So when you look at this data and you consider the pros and cons, it's inevitable that in actual fact, the workplace of the future will be a combination of greater levels of remote work, but also uh, we will be returning to some form of offices. So we think about this as the hybrid workplace of the future. And we really need to start thinking about how we reimagine for this hybrid workplace now so that organisations continue to figure out how they improve their operations, their innovation, and of course, ultimately employee satisfaction. 
technology will play a big role in this and we need to start thinking what technology is is required in order to enable this and ensure that remote participation is effective as being in an office in order for us to maintain that productivity and collaboration and just shrink the boundaries between the digital and the physical in particular you've got to consider all of the different outcomes that we need to plan for how do we ensure that people can collaborate can solve problems together how do we help their productivity how do we help learning and skilling and a number of other things you can see on screen in order to ensure that the organizations of the future in this new hybrid workplace can be as effective as they've been as they've been historically so we tend to think about the hybrid workplace having to think through in these three different um, pillars you need to think about the impact on people, the impact on the place of work and how processes need to be redefined as well. And all of this is going to be underpinned by technology, um, but it's not just the technology that is going to make a difference. You know, ultimately, it's about how companies are going to adapt. Um, they're going to how companies leadership is going to respond to ensure that that strong corporate culture is maintained despite all the changes that are about to happen in operations and in remote workforce. So let's take a quick review of these three pillars and the things that we need to be considering as we're thinking about the hybrid workplace of the future. So if you think about people, place and process, then it's essential that we think about, you know, all of the employees, not just those who are remote working, but those who actually have to be in a particular location to do their work. We need to be thinking about members of staff and their resilience um, and how we help them build connection and we look after their well-being. We've got a lot to think about around recruitment, attracting talent. Um, you know, historically, a lot of companies have used their office premises and the facilities that they provide as a way of attracting the best talent. But actually, as people start to remote work, do we need to change those benefits so that the benefits are more about how we support your home working, where we allow you to work from, how often we ask you to come in and the equipment that we provide you for home working. But then, of course, that has all sorts of other implications, such as who is going to pay for that and what are the tax implications? When we do go and recruit new talent, then we've got to start thinking about how we onboard, how people get the equipment remotely, how they get access to the technology and so forth remotely. And as I've already highlighted, thinking through that early in career capability, how we build those informal networks, how we allow for mentoring and people to get the same benefits of you know, connectivity with their colleagues. When it comes to space, you know, we are going to be facing a variety of different places of work. There's no doubt that the company office will still exist in the short term, certainly in a socially distanced way, meaning it has much lower capacity. But we'll probably see the rise of branch offices as people want to work in different locations. We may see a movement away from large city centres back to more, more rural or um, external environments where people want to you know, have a bit more space, a bit more access to the countryside, uh, you know, perhaps a lower cost of housing and so forth. So people are going to be working from home, but they may want to want to go and work from flexible locations such as coffee shops, such as WeWork type you know, locations or even offices, uh, even hotels, as they actually come together at certain times you know, to work with their colleagues. So you know, we've got to ensure that people can collaborate across all these different locations because you can imagine teams having to come together from a good combination of these and yet they still need to be as effective in collaborating and working well. So we've got to think about that collaboration just beyond the video calling that we typically all rush to as, the, as lockdown occurred. And then we need to start redefining the processes of tomorrow and how work actually gets done. So we need to start shifting to pure digital workflows that include everybody in the organization. We have to think about the personal productivity of the user as they're you know, now working entirely on their own. And they may not have that ability to just ask a colleague sitting next to them a question of how to get something done or where to find some information. How do we allow teams to come together to be creative and to solve problems? You know, and also, how do we ensure that they have the correct interaction with customers, partners and suppliers? And then, of course, there's the whole management and leadership. How do we ensure that teams can be managed correctly, have the right interaction with their managers? They can use that to get skilling and we can build cultures, you know, particularly from a leadership perspective, all the way across the organization and ensuring that in that organizational wide view, we're able to capture the knowledge within the organization and help connect people. So there really are many different vectors that we have to think through as we think about the organizations of tomorrow.
So now let's start to look at what the technology requirements are going to be in order to deliver on this hybrid workplace of the future. And we can really think about that in these six buckets. I'm just going to take a little bit of time to review each of them now um, and ensure that you know, we're thinking about all the different types of technology that either can be uh, uh, implemented to help with this or that may need to be adapted to deliver a great experience and to ensure we're getting the best out of the hybrid workplace and ultimately you know, drive up productivity, collaboration in order to return to growth and drive up employee satisfaction. So let's start off with cloud infrastructure. Now, clearly, if you're going to be working from multiple locations, then cloud has to be uh, incredibly effective. Now, there's tools like Microsoft 365 that more or less straight off the shelf allow people to provide huge levels of remote collaboration through email, through sharing, uh, through collaboration with Microsoft Teams. And this can be quite easily and quickly migrated with support services from Microsoft FastTrack. There are still many companies who, while started making the move to the cloud, have quite a significant number of applications and data on premise. And it's possible to start that straight lift and shift or some sort of hybrid operation with Azure using things like um, Azure Stack to start integrating your existing on-prem solutions into the cloud, including your applications. We have to start thinking through the basic infrastructure. So what do people require at home to work effectively? They're going to need a great modern device because it's going to be their key source of doing all their work. But they're also going to need accessories like headsets, like webcams, like monitors, keyboards, mice that allow them to be much more creative in their home office environment, as well as obviously strong connectivity. And all of those assets are going to need to be managed as well. Where people don't necessarily have the right tools and technologies, then how can we use Windows Virtual Desktop and remote desktoping to provide all the necessary applications securely to the company environment? Telephony 2 needs to be reimagined because traditional on-prem PBXs suddenly need to work from anywhere so that we can still you know, not only do conferencing, but we can ensure that we can transfer between different people and organizations in the department as well. So we need to effectively have cloud PBXing. And one of the things that we did learn quite early on is that networking really needs to be re-architected for this new world. Many companies just shifted very quickly to remote working, didn't change anything, and they were suddenly finding that every all of their data was still trying to run through the VPNs, but with many, many more remote users. And this clogged up the pipes and really started impacting users' performance. So networks need to be re-architected so that critical data that does need to come into to the corporate VPN does so, but things like Office 365 and many of the Microsoft 365 applications can just be accessed directly over the internet without clogging the VPN band work. And I just want to take a minute also to talk about first line workers. Now, first line workers are, are you know, critically the backbone of many businesses. They are the front line interacting with customers or operating uh, your facilities like warehouses and production. And they don't have the option of remote working like many knowledge workers and office workers do. But historically, they're also not necessarily the most connected to the digital infrastructure of the company. Therefore, the individual people are not receiving the broad communications. They don't have easy access to training and they can't communicate with their knowledge worker and their office worker counterparts, many of whom may used to be in the same building though them and now offer it operating remotely. So it can be really difficult for them to collaborate with their teammates and colleagues and they don't always have access to the information they need. And of course, many of these staff are also operating on quite historical old manual processes and paper based processes. So we need to figure out how to ensure that every member of staff can suddenly have a simple and secure access to all of the corporate digital uh, communications network. And we start to transform all of those processes to be digital as well. So one of the critical technologies uh, for the hybrid workplace of the future is clearly going to be the collaboration technology. Um, and at the beginning of sort of lockdown, as I said, we simply saw meetings shift from being in, in person to uh, online and people took to tools uh, like Cisco WebEx or Zoom and obviously Microsoft Teams just to do basic video conferencing. But as we start to reimagine of the hybrid workplace of the future, it's essential that we are more holistic and comprehensive in the way that we think about this technology. So in the early days of the pandemic, Microsoft iterated incredibly fast and developed the technology, bringing out key features like seven by seven uh, video, um, ensuring that the audio conferencing and the PSTN connectivity for dial out both internally and externally were absolutely first class, as well as the ability to collaborate with things like whiteboarding. But really, Microsoft Teams as the hub for teamwork offers a whole load more. And this really will become almost the way that work gets done in the future. It'll become that central point. 
So in addition to great video conferencing and audio conferencing capabilities, we need to help people get the work done where the work is in those chats, in those messages, in those meetings. And in order to do that, people need things like co-authoring for the office application. So multiple people can be working on files in real time um, and ensuring that everybody is always working on the latest data. We need to have smart meetings because if people are going to be working from multiple locations, it's essential that that meeting is as effective, whether somebody is in a coffee shop on their mobile device or is a number of people sitting in a headquarters or a branch office in a meeting environment with a large board at the front, a large projector screen. Um, and still people will need to be able to share information, documentation and whiteboarding to, to do that. And we have to start thinking about the whole life cycle of that. It's not just the meeting itself, it's the preparation for the meeting, the scheduling, making sure that everybody has the correct invite and the correct pre-reading and information. And then through the meeting, the, the notes are captured correctly, that whiteboarding is done effectively, and then following up that the information and the follow-up is all able uh, to be accessed by everybody who's attending, and that the work and the conversation can continue beyond the meeting as well. All of this needs to be done inclusively um, so that even if people are in noisy environments, they can see live captioning um, for those who need it. There is transcription. There is the ability to do things like blurring backgrounds so that you can get rid of background noise and make it easily uh, visually easy for people to engage in a conversation. So, you know, Teams really provides that much more um, than just basic video conferencing, and it will be the cornerstone to collaboration going forwards. So much so that we expect people will want to get the work done in that you know, conversation in the teams where the work is happening, be that a chat, a channel or a team. And therefore, we need to extend teams through third party applications. Obviously, all the core Microsoft Office and other applications are available directly in the team along with the files, but we can extend through third party applications and actually companies can start to bring their processes and their workflows into Teams through the use of the Power Platform and low code applications to make it easy to start digitizing uh, that, that transformation of those workflows. Now, if you're going to do a pure digital transformation, you're going to get to complete digital collaboration, um, co-working and processes, then it's 100% essential that all of this is done securely, particularly um, you know, given that people are working remotely. So no longer do we have this idea of a corporate environment where people can be on a corporate network that can be deemed secure because they're physically in the building with a large firewall around it. So we therefore have to shift to an identity first and a zero trust environment where we're always assuming breach and we, we, we don't trust anything until we have been able to validate. And typically we'll do that through validating the identity. You know, since lockdown and the pandemic, we've seen a massive increase in cyber threats. But because people are also working remotely, we have much more data and insight thanks to the Microsoft security graph. And we're able to use that data and insight to help protect people in real time and to use AI to help automate response to the threats that we see. Microsoft has a massively comprehensive security capability that is built in, not bolted on. It means that it's much easier to deploy and manage and ensure the, com the compatibility of all of those technologies. And we streamline everything. So we have the advanced threat protection tools that play all parts of the security stack to help keep all protected. And it's also therefore easy not just to deploy, but to manage that because we're significantly reducing the number of panes of glass needed to deliver security. So as I said, it's essential that we take a zero trust approach and therefore we're using identity as the prime vector for security. That means we need to enable multi-factor authentication and conditional access so that we always can trust uh, people accessing corporate resources. We need to make this simple um, so that the user has a really easy way, you know, single sign on across all of their on-prem and cloud applications across their devices, hopefully using things like Windows uh, Hello Biometrics as well. And they need to have that secure experience across all their devices, including personal mobile devices, which people use a lot more. And they need to feel comfortable that the separation between their personal data and the corporate data is happening and that the corporation is only managing and securing its data and not impinging on anybody's personal data. Again, with people working remotely, their ability to potentially take corporate data uh, out of the organization uh, and use it in a non-compliant way is much more challenging. And so we need those compliance tools to ensure GDPR and so forth. And as I said, you know, Microsoft through the M365 uh, stack and Azure have a huge level of integrated um, 
security capabilities, and that will actually help uh, lower the total cost of ownership. So if you think about, I'm not going to go through all of this, but this does show the level of capability in our consolidated security stack, taking in everything from threat protection through identity and access management, endpoint management, as well as both the cloud security and data protection. And by streamlining all of this, we think that you can simplify the way that it's deployed, managed, updated and secured. And therefore, there are some significant cost savings. In fact, there's potential to you know, save on up to 40 discrete products and integrate them with this end to end security view. So there's significant licensing revenue to be saved as well, moving to an M365 uh, capability. So if you're going to move to more devices, more remote working, data accessible everywhere in a secure way, then we've also got to be able to deploy and manage this remotely. And that means taking a cloud only or cloud first approach to management or connecting the existing on-prem and other management tools you have to cloud enable them. And so with Microsoft Endpoint Manager, we can now do that. It brings together Config Manager and MDM solutions that allows us to manage all of our devices across all platforms, mobile and all operating systems through effectively a single pane of glass. Do things like autopilot, it means we can take new devices and deploy them remotely. So as we have new joiners or people's machines need to be replaced, uh, we can now do that by drop shipping a device straight from the OEM to the end user, identifying that machine as a corporate asset. And through its first login, we're able to provision the device uh, in a secure way, ready to be used by the user without any touch from IT needed. And then how does IT help keep the expansive network now uh, of devices and applications both up to date and secure? Well, we have a lot of inbuilt telemetry and analytics that we're able to provide customers to actually analyze and understand what's going on on the network themselves. So they're able to have a look at their devices and their level of compatibility and to solve problems in advance and to look at the performance of those machines and push out remote tuning, etc., to improve the overall user experience. So it's just worth taking a very quick look at autopilot um, because this is going to be a key deployment technology in a remote world. Um, and this does allow people, as I said, to literally um, take the hardware vendor who would uh, put the hardware IDs of the devices that they're shipping into the cloud, ship the device straight to the user. And then when the user unbox it, they simply need to identify themselves with their secure corporate credentials. And then depending on how that has been configured in the cloud, we're able to enroll securely in management, push device profile and policies down, and then even start deploying apps all remotely over any internet connection. So just concluding, the last two things that we need to be thinking about as we think about uh, the different technology impacts of developing this new hybrid world. So user productivity is going to be essential. Um, we need to improve the user experience. Many, many users are very familiar with the Office applications. They've used them for many years, but they've also been using them the same way for many years. And the current versions of the Office 365 applications have really now got rich AI deeply embedded to help people get their work done faster. Capabilities like PowerPoint Design are enabling people who are working remotely on their own to still build great looking slides without having to be design experts or people doing analysis on Excel spreadsheets to get real insight from the data. The AI is starting to surface those rather than having to be uh, experts in data analysis themselves. As people work more uh, across different timings to get work-life balance, they need to be in control of their task management. And particularly, we need to think about that as groups, as project teams um, and organizational teams come together to get work done. They need to be able to do that task management holistically across platforms. Um, and we can do that with M365, um, everything from personal task management with To-Do, through groups with Planner, all the way through to sophisticated project management with Microsoft Project. And then on an individual basis, it's still important that people get access to that full breadth of the corporate knowledge. How do people find data when they can't necessarily ask their colleagues directly across the table, you know, where to go look for something or they need that little bit of help. So they need to have holistic search that allows them to find the right data or the right experts to go and ask in an integrated way wherever they're working. 
And then, of course, if we're going to improve productivity, we have to start digitizing those manual processes. And as I said before, we have the whole power platform that enable people to rapidly build applications, a line of business applications, integrate that tightly with teams and for anybody to start building those applications. This idea of citizen developers using these low code tools like Power Platform. And then finally, in order to enhance communication across the company, in order to ensure that leaders are clearly able to articulate the vision and the requirements across the organization, then we've got to have the right communication technology. So we need company wide communications, allowing things like virtual town halls, allowing SLT communication out across the work face and feedback back to them as well, as long as the as well as the basics like intranets. All of this needs to be absolutely you know, there and available to everybody so that when they're remote, they still are connected to the wider organization. We need to understand the employee's well-being. So we have anonymized data in Windows Analytics that can allow us to look at how well people are working, are focusing, are connecting um, and are taking time out and they don't get dragged into burnout by working all the hours there are just because they're working from home. And then finally, those same analytics tools can help us to start understanding our organizational networks and help people connect as well as creating, you know, finding the subject matter experts that they need to connect with and creating that idea of organizational social workplace, you know, workplace social connectivity to allow the wider organization to come together. So as you can see, there's quite a lot that we need to think about as we build the technology to support the hybrid workplace of the future. And in doing so, we really need to think about how we go about building that hybrid workplace. We have to think about how we transform the user experience, providing them with the right devices, the right technology, the right cloud enablement in a secure way. So we need to give people a modern device, help them use the AI that's in modern offices to get things done quicker. We really do seem as the teams as the new user interface to get work done. And we need to start consolidating the collaboration, the chat, the meetings and the workflow through third party app integration within teams as well. And then, you know, we've got to start driving that full digital transformation that we touched on a few times to ensure that every worker, including our first line workers, are brought into the digital organization for communication uh, and getting work done. Now, all of this is going to require great amounts of change. And so change management becomes essential. This needs to be, you know, well structured change management programs like ProSci. It needs to have executive sponsorship and it needs very frequent open communication across the organization so that people are brought on that journey with them. So ultimately, Microsoft is pretty uniquely situated to help partner with you on this journey. We have an incredibly comprehensive and integrated portfolio of solutions across our three clouds that are familiar to most users and easy to use. And critically, all of that is done on an incredibly secure platform that's easy for people to integrate with security and compliance and make sure that it's therefore followed. And all of that will hopefully lowering the total cost of ownership. You know, think that as you're saving money on buildings, potentially, you still need to make the right level of investments in the technologies for the end users in their remote workspaces to ensure that they get the best advantage that the best benefits of working in an organization, whether they're doing it in the office or remotely or from anywhere else. So in summary, we would say, you know, it's really essential that organizations start to em embrace the idea of a hybrid strategy, that they start thinking about how they're going to reimagine um, for the future in terms of the people, the place of work and the process. And that they're building a very strong technology underpinning um, that helps the leadership drive the ongoing corporate culture um, and therefore drive, you know, back to boosting productivity um, and protecting ultimately what matters in the organization. Thank you.